Can you please stop bothering my kid? Sorry. Arthur, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> this is the last time we'll be meeting. You don't listen, do you? You just ask the same questions every week. How's your job? Are you having any negative thoughts? All I have are negative thoughts. I'm Dan Persons, movie reviewer for Hour of the Wolf. Joker is fascinating and frustrating, compelling and infuriating. Thinking about it kind of objectively, it contains a heap of stuff I'd rail about in other films. Director Todd Phillips is not subtle in his mise-en-scene, where Tim Burton dressed Gotham City squalor in gothic grandeur, and Chris Nolan grounded his rendition in contemporary reality. Phillips washes the screen in a bilious green, and Rydoff posits a garbage strike that clogs the streets with trash. He tells a lot, mostly through the medium of newscasts, rather than shows, maybe a consequence of the film's relatively modest budget. There is not a glimmer of hope in the life of Joaquin Phoenix's soon-to-be Joker, Arthur Fleck, the inept clown for hire and failed comedian. He's mugged, mocked, betrayed by colleagues, abused by the elite. There's no sequence where a dog urinates on him, but that's probably in the outtake somewhere. Icing on the cake is that Phoenix delivers the kind of last-act monologue that has Oscar bait written all over it. Typically, I can't stand that kind of stuff. Let me break with tradition. I think the thing that separates Joker from Zack Snyder's glum forays into the DC Extended Universe is where Snyder seemed hell-bent on taking down everything we loved about Superman, Batman, et al. Phillips is delving into the genesis of a villain, so one can veer darker without necessarily betraying the character. He does mash the darkness button a little too hard. It's mere minutes into the film when the sad, lonely cello crops up on the soundtrack. Not everything needs to be telegraphed so blatantly. But in spite of, or maybe because of the ham-fistedness, Joker works. In weird ways, it has echoes of Phillips's other big hit, The Hangover, which wholeheartedly embraced the guy comedy genre it was playing in, while simultaneously transcending it. What's interesting for me is what Phillips, who also co-scripted, is doing with Joker's origin story. Joker, the film, bears a strong allegiance to Alan Moore's masterful origin tale, The Killing Joke, even though point for point, the plot deviates dramatically. Moore succeeded in generating more sympathy for his nascent Joker, though, who in the killing jokes telling is just a loser who did the wrong thing and as a consequence wound up in the wrong place at the wrong time, i.e. on the scaffolding of a chemical plant facing a certain dark night. In contrast, Phillips generates empathy for Fleck, but not much sympathy which in this case is fair since the character here starts out profoundly damaged and sublimating his darker impulses. A telling glimpse into the scrawled lines of Fleck's journal shows one entry as, and I'm paraphrasing here but it's close, one of the problems with having a mental illness is that people expect you to behave like you don't. Where Moore faltered was in finding a way to somehow draw a line from the loser who falls into a vat of chemicals to the criminal mastermind and arch-nemesis he would subsequently become. Phillips, intriguingly, covers that by positing Joker as the manifestation of a roiling societal violence, the rage of the abused made flesh. In that way, there's a direct connection between Phoenix's malevolently capering villain and Heath Ledger's terrifying anarchist in Chris Nolan's Dark Knight. Or there would be if it didn't appear that Warner's, no doubt thinking about all the action figures and Happy Meals they still want to sell someday, had a little bit of cold feet and encouraged Phillips to do something, I'm not going to say what, it's a spoiler, to take it all back just a bit. 
I don't think Phillips particularly objected to this request, if that's what it was. It's otherwise clear Warners gave him his head to do what he wanted the way he wanted, which is admirable. A low, low budget gives you that kind of power. But I think a strategically placed fade and a noticeably different mise-en-scene is a signal that maybe you shouldn't regard a certain section of the film as being as integral to the experience of Joker as a whole. Joker, I think, is going to raise a whole lot of arguments about what happens in it, about its worth overall. That, I think, justifies its worth to begin with. It does show that a comic book film doesn't necessarily have to court a teen audience, require infusions of wads of cash, or wind up with a last reel that's nothing but CG effects. It's far from perfect but it does in two hours what five seasons of Gotham couldn't. Tell a story in the Batman universe in which Batman doesn't figure and make it a worthwhile experience. There's a moment in the new SF film Ad Astra. I'm not going to tell you about it specifically because that'd ruin the surprise. But it comes as the spaceship that Brad Pitt is using to travel from the moon to Mars is diverted by a distress call from another ship. Pitt is playing an astronaut. Actually, he's revealed at the beginning to be not much more than a glorified maintenance man, one of the film's more clever moments, who's become more machine than man due to the death in his childhood of his illustrious scientist father on a mission in Neptune's orbit. Thirty years later, Pitt's just discovered that his father may actually be alive, may actually be the one responsible for the antimatter bursts that are disabling technology across the solar system, and having been recruited by the film's version of Space Force, they don't got guns, but they've got uniforms and conference rooms, to help lure his dad out of hiding, Robot Pit urges the ship's captain to ignore the SOS and get him to his destination. The captain, adhering to long-time established protocol, but also pointedly modeling the humanity our protagonist is not supposed to have, detours his craft, and not only replicates fine Star Trek tradition by heading up the rescue mission himself, but also takes Pitt, his passenger, mind you, along. And they do find out what the May Day is all about, and I can only presume that what director James Gray was shooting for was at least an adrenaline-pumping action moment, if not out-and-out -out horror. But the moment is such a non-sequitur, and the entire sequence has little to no relevance to the rest of the film, that it is nothing short of hilarious. I'm glad I was in an empty theater when I watched it. I embarrassed myself how hard I laughed. And that's the way it pretty much goes through the entire length of this misconceived space adventure with pretensions toward dramatic depth. I get the feeling that this project started with someone saying, can we do Arrival or Annihilation, but with, you know, like, a dude? That director Gray, who also co-wrote the script, didn't quite think through how that'd work, shows in the way a supposedly introspective narrative gets incongruously interrupted by action sequences in the way that the director, probably inadvertently, has cribbed elements from M. Night Shyamalan's After Earth, John Carpenter's Dark Star, and, most mind-bogglingly, Futurama, or in his apparent failure to notice that any supplemental character who crosses paths with Pitt's Jonah-like astronaut is an odds-on favorite to die. Not Ruth Nega, though, who plays someone sympathetic to Pitt's mission, who, based on her own backstory, should have no reason to be sympathetic to Pitt's mission. Ruth Nega is indestructible, if you haven't heard. Weirdly, the way the beats work out in Ad Astra made me feel like someone took a Luc Besson script and failed to notice that it was supposed to be a jokey sci-fi romp. The result is a self-serious hash, narrated from beginning to end by Pitt's glum space martyr, suggesting that possibly someone realized the film wasn't working. The production, to be fair, is impressive, even if director Gray doesn't seem to understand or has maybe chosen to ignore how physics should work, 
and the supporting cast, which includes Nega, Tommy Lee Jones as the rogue father, and Donald Sutherland as expositional convenience, is nothing short of respectable. And the film's very wrong-headedness in itself keeps you invested. I was definitely on for the ride after that unintentionally side-splitting spaceship rescue, curious to see how far they'd go. Frankly, they didn't disappoint. In the past few years, science fiction film has dared to take the woman's point of view and in the process opened the genre up to deeper explorations of emotional nuances. You can argue whether such depth needs to be gender-based, but Ad Astra's attempt to dude up this kind of narrative, which in this case amounts to nothing more than a guy getting in touch with his feelings, hits so many wrong notes that it winds up more comical than profound. It's fascinating and pretty enjoyable, honestly, but seriously flawed. For Hour of the Wolf, I'm Dan Persons.